I first, when I was first learning about muscles, my my professor had like this ad he was reading, uh, you know, you know, advert advertisement for a new motor, like you know, able, you know, very efficient, develops strong forces, able to run on a variety of fuels, um, you know, tastes great. <laughs> You know, you have muscle, muscle. It's like when you think of muscle, what is muscle? It's it's meat. If you're having a steak or you're eating your drumstick of your chicken, that's all skeletal muscle from some other animal. Um, so if you're like wondering what does muscle actually look like if you haven't taken anatomy, it just looks like meat. That's what that's what most meat is. It's just muscle. Um, but we're going to talk about muscle when it's still functioning in the animal. Um, so let's do it. Muscles. So muscle tissue in general contracts. You know, only muscle only contracts that's important like when you want to push obviously as a as an larger animal you can push it's like get away you push but that's mediated just by the lever system of your skeleton driven by muscles that are contracting right you're pulling on your back of your elbow and it makes your arm go out but it's a contraction of your tricep muscle that makes your arm go out. Muscles only contract. It also means that if you want to be able to undo an action, you're going to have to have, you know, minimally pairs of muscles. Like, you know, if I have some joint, maybe I should make the bones and, you know, I could have one muscle here that will pull the joint that way, but it means I got to have another muscle if I want to make it go the other way, right? You know, your biceps and your brachialis and brachioradialis will help you flex your elbow, but you need triceps and others to extend your elbow. So remembering muscles only contract is important. They're excitable. Um, we're going to find the cell membrane of muscles have the same voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels that we saw on the axon of the neuron. We're going to have big action potentials that just spread out along the entire cell um, as part of the excitation-contraction coupling to excite the contraction of the skeletal and all the muscle, I should say. So muscles, they contract, they're excitable. Um, you know, there's a couple of different kinds. There's skeletal. This is like the voluntary. It's also called striated because it looks kind of striped under the microscope. We'll see why it looks striped. It's just like the arrangement of the contractile proteins. It's like actin, then myosin, then actin, then myosin, then actin, then myosin. And they have slightly different optical properties. So under the microscope, it looks kind of stripey. Um, you know, operated by the somatic motor neurons releasing acetylcholine. Um, there's gonna be smooth muscle. Um, which tends to be involuntary. You know, all the stuff that you don't really think about so much, like adjusting the diameter of your blood vessels or squishing the food around in your intestines or changing the diameter of your pupil, of your iris or the curvature of your lens or pulling at the base of your hairs to give you goosebumps. You know, that's all smooth muscle. And then there's going to be cardiac muscle, which obviously is the muscle that is in the walls of your heart. 
that are going to keep your blood pumping. Um, you know, they all have kind of the basic idea of these two proteins, actin and myosin, pulling to create some contractile force. But there's also differences that we're going to talk about. We'll spend most of our energy focused on skeletal muscle and, you know, exactly what it looks like, how it works, how you excite it to contract its properties. Then we'll also go a bit into this as well as properties, there's specific properties of cardiac muscle that make it particularly suited to be, you know, your heart. Um, so we're going to start kind of talking more about the skeletal muscle and, and a little bit about the musculoskeletal system as well. Um, one of the things that's a little frustrating in teaching physiology as its own separate class and anatomy as its own separate class is, you know, there's anatomy, but then it's actually got you know, quite a bit of physiology that you, you know, bring into it to actually talk about like why, and we'll talk about the heart, but why do you have a heart? It's pumping the blood. In physiology, we'll talk about pumping the blood with the heart, but then we got to talk about the heart. So there's a lot of kind of intersection, this Venn diagram of anatomy and physiology, um, which means it limits the amount that you can actually cover in either class. Like when I've taught anatomy and physiology as like a two semester course at other colleges, um, a combined class, you get to actually spread out a little bit. We talk more about bones, for instance. Like our class is not going to talk about bones um, in the skeletal system directly. And yet they're dynamic living tissue, right? You break a bone, it's, you know, your, your bones are not just like a armature inside your body. They're like living tissue. They're making your blood. They are um, totally remodeling, changing um, their actual physical form based on the stresses put on them, repairing themselves if they get damaged. Um, you know, so bones, bones are actually cool and interesting, but we just don't have the time to cover them. They get kind of thrown under the bus. <laughs> I, I'll just kind of say that just because we don't have a specific like segment of our class talking about bones doesn't mean they aren't cool and interesting and worthy of getting to know. Um, all right. So speaking of bones, let us talk a little bit about how bones are connected to muscles. So a few things to think about. One is that, you know, typically, you know, muscles, you know, have like agonist, antagonist, um, I'm going to, they're not really always pairs, but usually if there is a muscle that does some action, there's going to be some other muscle that can undo that action. Because like I said, muscles only contract. So if you have a muscle that makes this joint go this way, you need to have some other muscle that makes the joint go the other way. It's not always, it's not always a pair. Um, in fact, there are often more than one muscle to do with the same action. If you're gonna flex your elbow, there's biceps brachii, 
there's brachialis, there's brachioradialis. Um, right? There's a variety of muscles that can do that same action, contribute to it. Sometimes some muscle contributes more or less to different ranges of the motion. But you know, there's, there's backup. Your hamstrings, you've got semimendrinosis, semitendinosis, biceps um, femoris. They all are flexing your knee and extending your hip. You know, so you've got this backup. If one muscle is not working well, it doesn't mean that that joint isn't going to work anymore. Um, so just kind of putting that out there. Um, often one muscle contributes to more than one action. So for instance, like the classic, like biceps brachii muscle, like the, you know, the Popeye muscle with when you eat your spinach or whatever, you know, you can feel it. If you flex your elbow, you can feel this muscle flex because it pulls on your lower arm and flexes your elbow. But it's also just as important as a supinator. If you hold your bicep muscle and you spin your thumb outward, like this, you should just do it. Put your hand on your bicep and spin your thumb outward, you're going to feel that biceps muscle flexing just as hard as if you were flexing your elbow. You know, so that biceps muscle is yanking on the radius to spin your thumb outward, supinate. You know, so, and actually the biceps muscle crosses your shoulder joint as well. It helps flex your shoulder. Um, so you can have the same muscle doing more than one thing, you know, depending on what the rest of your muscles are doing. Um, so that's important. Um, another thing is just because the muscle is contracting doesn't mean that it's getting shorter or that. So for instance, think about, um, let me go. You know, here's, here's somebody, here's somebody, let's say they're holding a weight. You know, and there's, here's the biceps muscle here, which can flex the elbow. You know, this is gonna like pull the arm up, but so there's, a couple, two things that can happen here, or th there's three things that can happen here. One is I can contract, I can generate force with this muscle and I'll be lifting up this weight. That is called a concentric contraction. But the other thing that can happen is what if I want to slowly lower the weight down, right? I actually need to generate force. I need to contract my biceps muscle or else my arms just going to go boof and fall down like a rock. So I generate force in this muscle, but this weight wins. So the weight actually slowly lowers. That's going to be called an eccentric contraction. The muscle let's do green. Right, so my biceps muscle is still contracting. It's generating a contractile force, but it's less than the force of gravity pulling the weight down. So the muscle is actually getting longer, even though it is generating a contractile force. Does that make sense? Um, both of these are examples of what are called isotonic contractions.
It means that we're generating a force and the muscle is changing length, but it might be getting shorter in a concentric contraction or longer in an eccentric contraction. Um, the eccentric contractions where you are fighting and like slowly lowering something, these tend to cause more damage to the muscle um, fibers. Um, you'll be more sore. If, you, if you're doing exercises where you're slowly lowering heavy weights, your muscles are gonna be a lot sore afterwards and it's gonna trigger these programs to increase your muscle mass and make your muscles stronger. You know, Cause your body's basically saying, well, my muscle wasn't quite strong enough to deal with the force there. Um, so like if you wanna bulk out, you'd wanna kind of, if you slowly lower things, that's gonna be more likely to cause, make sore muscles, but also make the muscles respond by increasing the amount of contractile protein so they can be stronger in the future. Um, what if the force of the muscle and the force pushing against the muscle are exactly balanced? Right, I, like both my hands right now are pushing. This arm is pushing, this arm is pushing, but nothing's moving. My hands are staying right in the middle here. Right, my muscles are definitely, I can feel them, I can feel them. They're contracting, they're pushing, but nothing is moving. The muscles aren't changing length at all. Is that isometric? Mm -hmm. Isometric contraction. And so that's the other option is you can have a muscle contract and just balance out the other force. So there's no actual movement, but it's still contracting. It needs to generate the force to just balance the other force. Right? I mean, if I am holding some weight up, you know, I am holding up my cup here nothing's moving, but I'm generating force to fight against the weight of the cup trying to push down. These are isometric contractions. So you can contract and be isometric, no change. Concentric, where the muscle shortens. Eccentric, like slowly lowering something um, against gravity. So those are all different versions of, of types of contractions that muscles can do. Uh, the last thing I'll mention before we do our break is this idea of lever systems, which I think is, is worth talking about just, you know, just briefly. So just to remind people, levers are like teeter-totters, right? If I have a lever and I have the fulcrum is what we call kind of the pivot point. If the fulcrum is right in the middle, then whatever you do here is gonna be kind of reflected on the other side. However far this distance moves, this will move that same distance. Whatever force you push here will be the same force this is gonna be um, experiencing here. But if you move the fulcrum, it gets very different. You know, here, if I push this down a certain distance, this is going to come up a way farther distance. But I need a lot more force here, and it'll be a lot less force here. In fact, it's going to be based. It's probably worth, yeah, let me. All right, I, if I, let me, it's probably better if I just stop sharing here a second. All right, oh, I need to get out of.
Yeah, it was, I was realized when I was looking at the recording that all of my, all my like squirrels and owls having their big nature drama that was all in a tiny little square in the corner. I, I, did, I meant to do this. All right, so here, if I put like the pivot right in the middle, I push on one side, the other side goes up and down with the same amount of swing. And you can't really feel it, but however hard I push here is the same force that is pushing up here. If I put the pivot, however, on the far end, I have one side, it's not moving very far at all, but the other side is moving really far and fast. So I have this big win in amplifying how the range of motion and the speed that this other side of the ruler is moving. You know, the trade-off is in the force. I have to, you know, if I, if this is a 10 to one um, ratio where my pivot point is here, I have this side moving 10 times as far and fast, but only one tenth of the force. So I need to exert 10 times as much force here as I want to appear at the far end of the ruler. So this is the trade-off of a lever. You can magnify or you know, magnify distance and speed at the expense of the needing more force, or I could do it the other way. Like if you're trying to move a rock, you can use a lot more distance here, but then exert a lot more force at the far end of the pry bar here to move the rock away or something. I mean, most people have some just intuitive experience of working with levers and trying to pry things out and stuff. But most of your muscles are connected to your skeleton in a lever system, kind of like I just showed with, like if here is you, Now your biceps muscle is kind of from here. It attaches right near the elbow joint itself. It does not go very far. So when this muscle, you know, it has a certain amount it can contract, certain speed it can contract. The range and speed that actually happens at your hand is way faster kind of like the end of the ruler, right? My muscles can't contract as fast as I can move my limb. But because it's connected in this lever system, whatever movement is happening here right near my elbow due to my bicep is amplified like tenfold here at my hand in terms of the range of motion and the speed. Again, the trade-off is the amount of force I'm generating at my hand is going to be less. It's going to be proportionally less to the force. This biceps muscle actually has to generate 10 times as much force here as I want to appear here out here at my hand. So does that make sense? You know, your book will talk about class one and all these different classes of levers and stuff. It doesn't, I don't care about that. Don't worry about classes of levers, but I do want you to kind of understand the benefit of hooking up your muscles in lever systems like this, because it allows you to take a muscle that has a certain range of distance it can contract, a certain speed that it can contract, and you can amplify that pretty dramatically by hooking it up, just like I'm showing here. 